Brussels Buck, ay. Hello. Today I'd like to talk about a fairly notorious manager training video made by Amazon, the full version of which was made available online back in 2019. It's what we in the film industry call a corporate video, the likes of which I have worked on before myself, although in my case it was of the live action shot by a small film crew variety rather than animation. The fact that Amazon went with animation is something I'm going to get to soon. In the film industry, many techos will do corporate videos in between better paid, more stable jobs like a large budget feature film. And many small production companies will use corporate videos to help get themselves off the ground in the early days after forming, before they are able to take on bigger, more elaborate productions like music videos, documentary projects, and short films. It's bread and butter type work in the industry. So on one hand, that's what this Amazon thing is, it's a corporate video. On the other hand, it's also blatant anti-union, anti-worker propaganda. And on yet a third hand, I guess we're a chaos mutant in this metaphor. On the third hand, it is increasingly as it goes along, an ultra-authoritarian Big Brother nightmare that verges on making any future attempts at parody of capitalism utterly redundant. I knew almost immediately that I needed to jump back on YouTube for a hot minute and put out a response to this abomination, and it struck me that the most enjoyable way for me to go about that was to do an old school Garrett response video like the Armored Skeptic one I made in December 2015 back on my original channel. You know, I play the video while incessantly pausing to riff on it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Let's go! Before I actually press play on this thing, first I wanted to talk about their choice not only to make it animated, but some of the cheapest, shittiest looking animation ever made by adults. The choice to go with animation was pretty much out of necessity for a few reasons. One of which being that film crew workers typically belong to a union, like the IATC in the US and Canada, and the Screen Industry Guild here in New Zealand. And uh, you're not going to get any self-respecting union worker to help make anti-union propaganda. A fact which Amazon surely knows all too well. Plus, unions have this pesky way of ensuring that workers like those on a film set have to be paid more than pocket lint and kind words. And lastly, I presume they want to be able to dub over other voices in different accents and languages in order to use this video in other countries. So Amazon was kind of forced to go with animation here, but I am still taken aback by just how cheap and shoddy this is. Typical mentality of a large corporation. Wants to make effective propaganda, but is so overwhelmingly preoccupied with squeezing every last cent from every conceivable avenue that the idea of spending adequately on even something this ideologically important to them just doesn't even occur. And lastly, something I should probably bring up. Throughout the video, workers are referred to as associates because corpo speak. And I thought this comment kind of summed things up as far as that is concerned. Okay, enough preamble. Press play. Welcome. We're excited to have you at this training, specifically designed to give you the tools that you need for success when it comes to labor organizing. So this video was made as part of a union busting training program for managers. Management personnel are the intended audience, not workers. Though this is only clearly stated in some of the video's six modules and not others. So it is possible that parts of it were slash are shown to workers as well? I don't know. In this section, you will learn Amazon's position on unions, why we prefer a direct working relationship. Hmm, gee, I wonder why they might prefer a situation where there's a lone worker on one side of the table and all of management on the other. It's almost as if that might make it so the bosses hold all of the power and the lone worker is completely subjected to their whim and at their mercy. On a wing and a prayer, Amazon style. And how to discuss unions in an appropriate tone that fits Amazon's culture. Unions pose a threat to this direct connection. This commitment to a direct connection with our associates makes union representation unnecessary. Look workers, we prefer to hold all the cards in this power dynamic. So if you could just kindly refrain from picking up your cards and instead add them to our hand, we can commence with this totally fair game of poker. Anti-union propaganda tries to otherize unions as much as possible. Unions are worker organizations. They are made up, wait for it, of workers. Who does an Amazon warehouse worker really have more in common with? A worker at a warehouse across the street? Or some middle manager or millionaire executive at Amazon? Amazon would have you believe it's the latter, because that's in their financial interest. A union is not interfering with the boss's ability to negotiate with the workers. They are the workers. They're not ice warriors. They're not from Mars. 
These Jim Hadar from Deep Space Nine are not members of the Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union. You're just going to have to trust me on that. We are not anti-union, but we are not neutral either. What? The only way to be neither anti-union nor neutral is to be pro-union. Amazon aren't claiming to be pro-union, so the only way to interpret this is that it's some double-think bullshit. It's not that we don't like unions, it's just that our attitude towards them is negative. This isn't a can of soup, it's some soup that's been placed inside a cylindrical metal receptacle, you see? One thing's for sure though, we definitely aren't neutral towards those damned blasted unions. We do not believe unions are in the best interest of our customers, our shareholders, or most importantly, our associates. It's definitely better for the bosses to negotiate with disorganized workers one by one. I mean, what's that one worker gonna do if they don't like the terms? Quit? And what if there isn't work of that sort around in that area at that time? Suck it up, cupcake? Or, or what, quit and change careers all because your boss can't be asked bumping your pay up a few bucks so that you don't need to get food stamps anymore? And presumably, if the one worker in this hypothetical doesn't like the terms imposed by their employer, it seems likely that many of the other workers there won't be happy either, right? They have shared interests as a workforce after all. So what, half the workforce quits every time there's a dispute between workers and their boss? Does that really seem like the best way to go about that? Of course not because that's not what Amazon really wants. They don't want workers to quit in swathes every time the boss screws them over. What Amazon wants is suck it up cupcake. They win, you lose. And unions, well, they get in the way of that by giving the workers more power. And we can't have that now, can we? Our business model is built upon speed, innovation, and customer obsession. Things that are generally not associated with the unions. This is just corporate gobbledygook. Let me try a version. Synergize me some robust corporate speak, online generator. Our business model is based on enthusiastically transitioning impactful technologies. Our business model is based on fungibly extending reliable catalysts for change. Our business model is based on proactively formulating leading edge manufactured products. With this one, you can generate entire press releases of corporate bullshit. Likewise, our culture values a robust, open dialogue between associates and managers, so we can work together as one team, continuously innovating, simplifying, and improving things for our customer. While we understand unions work in some industries, they would conflict with our culture, customer obsession, and direct working relationship. Huh, so you're saying that unions just plumb conflict with your particular industry. So that's the problem, is it? It's not that you hate unions with a fiery, demonic passion, it's that unions just don't work in the industry Amazon happens to be in. It's just one of those weird coincidences. Someone should really tell Amazon Germany about this though, because Amazon's German workforce is heavily unionized, and Amazon.de seems to be doing fine. More than fine. They've got buku bucks. Or to put that into the original French, beaucoup billet. They got mad market share, just like they do in most other places. Almost seems like unionization isn't really a factor here or something. We don't badmouth unions in general, but we will speak openly with associates about unions, including any specific concerns about particular unions involved in organizing. First, let me fix this up real quick. That's better. Actually, I think we can do better. There it is. Now, when they say we don't badmouth unions in general, I would point to the existence of this corporate video as some pretty clear evidence to the contrary. And when they say specific concerns about particular unions involved in organizing, what they mean is, if any Amazon workers reach out to a union, like what happened recently in Alabama, then Amazon will propagandize and disinfo the absolute hell out of that union and blame them for all the world's ills, except for the ones they think are good actually. And we share our preference for a direct working relationship frequently and boldly, even when no organizing activity has occurred. Allow me to translate that for you. We're not reactionaries on the subject of unions. We're hardline ideologues about it. A complete lack of any evidence of unionization won't stop us from shoving our propaganda into our workers' faces at every opportunity. That's just how we roll, dog. And of course, I gotta bring up the whole direct working relationship thing that they keep repeating throughout this video in the same manner as a, a politician drilling their key words into people's heads. Strong and stable leadership with the strong economy that comes from a strong and stable government to elect the strong and stable leadership of a conservative government. A choice between the strong and stable leadership of the conservatives when you have the strong and stable leadership is only achievable by a strong uh, and stable government. If you've got the strong and stable leadership, vote for a strong 
strong and stable leadership with a strong and stable government. If we secure the strong and stable leadership our country needs. Strong and stable for strong and stable leadership. Strong and stable. The strong and stable. Strong and stable leadership. 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 I thought for a moment the Prime Minister was going to say Brexit means Brexit again. Direct working relationship. Direct connection with our employees. Direct connection. Direct connection with our associates. Direct relationship with associates. Direct working relationship. Direct working relationship. Direct working relationship. Work directly with associates. Direct working relationship. Direct working relationship. Work with associates directly. Direct working relationship. Direct working relationship. Let me show you a direct working relationship. This is about as direct as it gets. Hopefully these two can negotiate to reduce the lashes from whenever he damn well pleases to some sort of bi-hourly system. In this next bit, four hypothetical managers are presented, each one reacting to a worker bringing up unions with them, and the viewer has to choose which reaction most closely fits with what Amazon's position on unions is, or so they say. Even though only one of them represents Amazon's supposed position and the others don't, the correct answer here really does not mesh with reality in any meaningful way, so I think it's fair game to respond to all of them. Unions? Well, um, I guess that's really up to you guys. I guess they're like any business. Some are good, and some are bad. They're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. And, uh, unions are not just like businesses, by the way. Even just legally speaking, that's not the case. They are fundamentally different types of institutions, even in the eyes of the legal system. And in the eyes of people with eyes. I think you should just do some research and figure it out for yourselves. Whatever you do, I'll respect your decision. Encouraging the worker to do independent research? Well, it can't be her. This is corporate propaganda, not high fantasy. And sure enough, it isn't her. Moving on. Unions? Bunch of thieves and crooks if you ask me. You really think a union would work in this day and age? I love this. As if unions are purely theoretical and not currently in existence all over the world, representing millions upon millions of workers engaging in strikes, forcing employers to back down from threatened pay cuts. As if these things are just ideas. Like Marvel's What If series. What if unions, everyone? <laughs> we have to move quickly if we want to keep our customers happy. The union, they're just a bunch of dinosaurs waiting around for someone to tell them they're extinct. So, the corporation, not old-fashioned at all, sleek and hypermodern, invented in the early 17th century. The union, totally dusty, no thanks, grandpa, invented in the early 19th century. I agree that one of these is a dinosaur and the other is not. I just come down on the other side of this one because of, well, how time works, for one thing. All they want is money and they don't do jack for employees. I don't know why you'd even consider them. All they want is money, those greedy unions. We capitalist pig dogs are more enlightened than that. It's not that we want to put profit before all other concerns, it's just that the entire point of a corporation by law is to do that. Unions? I guess that's ultimately up to you guys, but I don't think they would work here. Our whole business model depends on being fast and flexible to keep our customers happy. I'd rather work directly with you guys to make that happen. I would hope that's what you want too. But if you have any questions or concerns, I'll do my best to answer them, or if I don't know, to get answers for you. You can tell just by how she talks like a corporate mouthpiece that she's going to be the correct answer. She's got that faux reasonable thing down. If this was live action, she'd have a big ol' fake smile, and would be blinking just a little too much. This is the image that Amazon wants to project about their attitude towards unions. But reality says mucho diferente, which we will get to later. Unions? We don't need to talk about that. You've got me, and if you have a problem with me, you can go to my boss. And if you've got a problem with my boss, fuck you. Hierarchy. It's just the way it is. No other option. Too bad. Anyway, moving on. Once the viewer selects the correct manager, they get this. Correct. The manager is acknowledging associates' right to choose for themselves. You know, I'm guessing if I went over to Alabama and asked those folks if they think that management acknowledging the workers' right to choose for themselves is an accurate reflection of the way things are, I'm thinking they're going to say no, or just laugh? The next segment is about labor laws in the United States, and I have less to say about this part, but there are a few choice moments in it, starting with this one. 
employees have the right to act collectively. In other words, employees are considered to have strength in numbers. They have the right to band together for mutual aid and protection. This part is actually a really good introduction to why unions are good, and how they help workers. And hearing the phrase mutual aid in an anti-union propaganda video is pretty funny. I also like how the little workers banding together enables the whole group to succeed, when some of them would otherwise fail. Thank you for accurately describing the benefits of joining a union, Amazon. When I first watched this video, I mistakenly thought that the intended audience was workers, and I was really confused as to why Amazon would stop in the middle of this anti-union propaganda piece to correctly describe how unions help workers. Then, once I realized that the intended audience was actually management, it all made sense. What this means is that employees have the right to compare notes, to discuss things like their wages and benefits to see how they are being treated. They have the right to take concerted action, to act together to gain the protections inherent in being part of a group rather than taking individual stands on issues. That makes it sound like being part of a union makes you less able to take a stand on an issue as an individual, but that's not the case at all. It actually opens up a new platform for you to take such a stand, that being the union itself. Let's use the example provided by the video of workers comparing their payslips to see what each other are being paid and to make sure everyone's being paid fairly. Let's say there's a workplace where that's not happening. Workers are not comparing payslips. What if one of those workers decides that this is something that they and their colleagues or workmates should be doing, since it is one of the cornerstones of organizing, and decides to argue their case to some of the other workers? And let's say that these other workers are very hesitant. Maybe because their boss had gone through a union-busting training course and now discouraged workers from unionizing with threatening overtones. So our hypothetical worker has taken an individual stand on an issue, and in this case it hasn't gone anywhere, because all of the other individual workers feel intimidated by a powerful management's clear stance against workers organizing. But the worker also has the choice of approaching an existing union, and seeking assistance from them to help convince their workmates, again taking a stand as an individual, this time on a different platform, one that exists in addition to their actual workplace, and thus gives them more options. The National Labor Relations Board is a federal agency with broad authority over the employees' rights covered in this module. The NLRB investigates unfair labor practice allegations, that is, alleged violations of the federal labor law, such as interfering with employee rights. And luckily for us here in Amazon Management, they are pretty firmly on our side regardless of which party is in power. Look around the rest of the world and compare the National Labor Relations Board to similarly empowered governmental and non-governmental institutions, and well, the NLRB doesn't come out looking great. Unless you're Amazon Management, of course, then it's Christmas. Unfair labor practices can be committed by either an employee or a union. It is important to remember that unfair labor practice means something that is unlawful. Several things that workers or unions might argue are unfair in the ordinary sense of the word, such as a particular wage scale or employee layoffs, are completely lawful and therefore not unfair labor practices. Oh, are you annoyed that you're being paid a poverty wage and thus having to seek additional income from a series of crappy part-time jobs in the evenings and weekends? and that you never get to see your partner and kids anymore? The US government is just as amoral and oppressive as we are, and they think the particular way we're destroying your life is A-OK. -okay. So suck it, dipshit. This stuff about unfair labor practices refers to violations of the National Labor Relations Act, and it is a specific legal term in the United States. It even has its own wiki page, and check it out. Its own little acronym. Aww. You'll notice on this wiki page's breakdown of what an unfair labor practice is according to US law that there are a few more bullet points governing and restricting union activities than there are governing and restricting employer activities. Nominee for least shocking thing ever. And even the restrictions that there are on employers are lenient on the corpos. For example, as this part states, an employer needs to go pretty far when violating a collective bargaining agreement in order to fall foul of the law. You know, a little violation here and there, well, that's just business as usual. Literally. I should note here, I'm not a legal scholar, especially not of US employment law. Frankly, I find the subject depressing to research. So I'm hesitant to speak too much here about the specifics of this subject in case I get something wrong. If anyone can correct me on something in the comments section, please do so. But I wanted to talk more generally about this whole idea of fairness being legally defined in the first place. One of the things I dislike about the justice system model we use 
is the bureaucratic, one-size-fits-all nature of it. Might seem like a good idea at first, might even seem like a great example of fairness to go about things in that way, but the notion of fairness itself is to me a perfect demonstration of why it's not so great. The idea that Amazon mentions in the video that, technically speaking, if it is legal, then by definition it is fair. It is important to remember that unfair labor practice means something that is unlawful. And that just seems wrong to me. That seems ripe for abuses of all kinds. That seems deeply authoritarian and bound to not reflect the realities of life on the ground level, so to speak. Several things that workers or unions might argue are unfair in the ordinary sense of the word, such as a particular wage scale or employee layoffs, are completely lawful and therefore not unfair labor practices. As Amazon says, you might think you're being treated unfairly, but actually you're not, because some people that are hundreds or even thousands of miles away said so. And hey, they went to the trouble of writing it down and everything, so we gotta respect that, I guess. It kinda reminds me of the Kafka story, The Trial, or more specifically, of the film adaptation of The Trial, directed by Orson Welles. A real masterpiece of a film, by the way. It's about an everyman who is faced with an absurdly bureaucratic legal system. The notion of someone being treated unfairly, but then being told that their understanding of what happened to them is incorrect. That their entire perception of reality is flawed. That what they experienced as blatant unfairness was, in fact, perfectly fair and okay. Because the government says so. For one thing, what is and is not considered fair in the eyes of both the law and of society in general changes massively over time. In the United States, it was at one time considered fair and legal for one human being to own another. Whole generations of disposable people. Some might say that this is an extreme comparison to make, but within the context of the history of US law, it is among the clearest possible analogies that exists. To put it bluntly, Across large swathes of land in pre-Civil War America, it wasn't considered an unfair labor practice to enslave someone. And it was considered an unfair labor practice to try and escape from enslavement. And we, as a modern audience, with the exception of fascists of course, can look back at that example and see how absurd it is to tie the concept of fairness to the concept of legality in any kind of uniform, blanket way, like the specific wording of a federal law. And the key thing to understand here is that regardless of whether the wider society at the time knows that slavery is wrong or not, the person being enslaved does know. And you don't need to be at that extreme end of the spectrum of mistreatment to recognize when you are being treated unfairly. My point is, what society considers to be fair and acceptable changes drastically over time, as does the law. But the people being negatively affected by the system at any given time know full well that what is happening to them is not fair. Let's assume that most of the ways they mistreat their workers are considered legally acceptable. I don't have any data on that, but let's just say that this is the case. That most of the ways Amazon screws over their American workers are legally speaking A-OK. -okay. That doesn't make those forms of mistreatment just. It doesn't make them moral. It doesn't make them fair. An Amazon warehouse worker trying to exist within the rigged TOT system knows that shit is not fair, that it's not okay, regardless of what the current legislation says on the matter, regardless of what the legal system of this time and place counts as an unfair labor practice and what they don't. The worker who has had to take part-time jobs on the side just to make ends meet knows that it's not right, that it's not a fair labor practice to pay someone so little they need to get food stamps in order to survive. Okay, rant over. The next part discusses what is and is not considered protected activity under the eyes of the law, and hence what is and is not actionable by the NLRB. The easiest way to spot this type of protected activity is to look for anything that involves more than one person, or is done on behalf of more than one person. I have an issue that impacts me is not generally protected activity. We have an issue that impacts us, or I have an issue who else is with me, are telltale signs of potentially protected activity. Remember earlier when the video was going on about the direct working relationship between boss and employee that Amazon so treasures? Well now we've got some context for that, don't we? So a worker approaches management, and unless their complaint also affects other workers, the boss can just completely shut down and ignore this complaint, and there's nothing the worker can do about it. No appealing to the NLRB, sorry sweetheart, no dice. In other words, if the worker wants their complaint to actually be listened to and maybe even acted upon, they need to talk with their co-workers first, make sure the issue is affecting them also, and then approach management. Well gee Amazon, it almost seems like being in a union would make that a whole lot easier and more normalized by making the workers organized, encouraging them to cooperate with each other in conflicts with the bosses. 
It kind of seems to me like this part is low-key meant to communicate to the managers in the anti-union training program what the phrase direct working relationship really means. As in, hey managers, it's better for us if you get your workers to communicate with you one-on-one, without them having spoken with colleagues, since that way the legal deck is totally stacked in our favour. In the next segment, the viewer has to choose if things said by hypothetical workers qualify as protected by the NLRB or not. You're being totally unfair to me. I work my butt off. All you do is ride me all day. It doesn't matter how much I pick. If I'm off task for five lousy minutes, you're out there asking me, what's my barrier? What's keeping me from working? I know what you really mean is, what's wrong with you? You don't respect me. All you do is take, take, take. This is not likely protected activity. Although the associate's concerns may sound familiar, she is not purporting to speak for or about a group. She's raising a personal issue. Her level of passion does not create protection. It's better for workers to organize as a group, got it? And the best way to do that is, of course, with a union. When I think about a group of workers trying to organize without a union backing them, that's a really difficult, undesirable, uphill situation. And it kind of seems like if that weren't the case, workers wouldn't want to undertake the difficult process of forming a union in the first place, or take the time and energy to get their workplace into an existing union. Isn't that right, Amazon workers of Bessemer, Alabama? Here's the next hypothetical worker. What you did to Joe wasn't right. He worked here for three years. That ought to count for something. He made one screw up. I know it was TDR and believe me, I get how serious that is. But it ain't right that you fired him after three years for one lousy mistake. This is likely protected activity. While this is all about Joe's personal situation, it is not Joe that is raising the complaint, but rather one of his co-workers. Co-workers have a protected right to speak up for each other. Mutual aid. Solidarity forever. An injury to one is an injury to all. Union strong. In unity there is strength. So be strong. But honestly, this part of the video isn't that bad. We've got a real train wreck part coming up, so let's move on. The next module is titled Warning Signs. And if there was ever a warning sign, it is seeing the title Warning Signs. This is where the video really starts to get wild. In this section, you will learn about the warning signs most commonly associated with early union organizing, as well as other warning signs that could indicate associate disengagement, vulnerability to organizing, or early organizing activity. Are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? You want to see your name on a list? Are you now, or have you ever been? While those clips were in reference to the second Red Scare of the 1940s and 50s, really, this heavy-handed anti-union stuff is more reminiscent of the lesser-known first Red Scare. Don't get me wrong, some really damaging stuff happened to American unions in the second Red Scare. For example, the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 that was passed in reaction to the Great Strike Wave of 1945 and 46, in which 4.3 million American workers went on strike. The Taft-Hartley Act prohibits unions from engaging in most of the direct action tactics traditionally favored by radical unionists. Tactics which, if you've seen my series Analyzing Rocker, should sound very familiar. Things like sympathetic strikes, general strikes, wildcat strikes, and organized boycotts. And it also banned some of the more general union type stuff like jurisdictional strikes and closed shops. And it allowed the states to pass right to work legislation banning union shops. It placed general restrictions on how strikes are legally allowed to be undertaken. It required union officials to sign affidavits with the Department of Labor declaring that they were not members of the Communist Party. Are you now, or have you ever been to Munchkinland? We represent... Oh, and Taft-Hartley just straight up banned federal employees from striking. And it remains in effect to this day. And without it, Amazon likely wouldn't even be legally allowed to show this anti-union propaganda video to their managers. But as I said before, today I'd like to talk more about the first Red Scare, which occurred in 1919 and 1920. The post-First World War period, like the First World War itself, was a time of hyper-nationalism. And what happens when there's a sudden rise in the popularity of the far right? 
the far left mobilizes to counter them. Then the state points to this rise in far left activity and says, bad people doing bad things must stop bad peoples from do bad thing, rather than clamping down on the simultaneous spike in the far right in any substantive way. Because of course, a rise in ultra-nationalist fervor only serves the state, and only happened to the degree it did at that time, because the state encouraged it to. It was convenient, for the war effort, you see. Anyway, the government went after leftist radicals, with perhaps the central figure in those efforts being the Attorney General, Alexander Mitchell Palmer. Palmer's tactics included rounding up immigrant anarchists and other socialists, and quickly deporting them back to their countries of birth. One of the cogs in the Palmer machine was a 24-year-old J. Edgar Hoover, he was put in charge of the radical division that pursued far-left groups. Oh, and by the way, the way the first Red Scare ended was when Hoover tried to bait the far-left into doing an uprising on May Day 1920, so he could use that as a justification for a huge clampdown on leftists. They didn't take the bait, and the whole thing fizzled out. Crime has a partner, informing the common denominator of a breakdown in moral behavior. It is the influence of godless communism. They are, by Nikita Khrushchev's own description, a valuable arm of the international conspiracy against God and freedom. There was also a big white supremacist, racist element to the first Red Scare as well. There were race riots in Chicago, Washington DC, Charleston, Indianapolis. There was a massacre in Arkansas, race riots in Wilmington, Delaware, and in Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, Nebraska, several other states, and Bisbee, Arizona. We live in a town, Bisbee, Arizona. It's a beautiful little town, 6,000 people on the Mexican border. Yep, yeah, Bisbee's a great place, all right with quite a history. Alongside the race riots, there was also the popularization of the far-right, paranoid myth of what would come to be known as International Jewry. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the foundational text of modern conspiracy theorist anti-Semitism, had been brought into the US by a czarist piece of crap who had fled the revolution, and it was translated into English by a government employee, who asked for and received permission to translate the work from their superiors at the Department of War. The translated Protocols was then the basis of an article by the Dearborn Independent, a newspaper owned by a noted hardcore anti-Semite Henry Ford, who then adapted the protocols into a four-volume set of pamphlets titled The International Jew, which was soon translated into German and quickly influenced the nascent Nazi party. This isn't supposed to be about the first Red Scare in general though, so I will stick to looking at it briefly from a labor perspective. As well as the aforementioned countering of the far right, there was another major reason for the surge in the popularity of the far left at that time, and this one was perhaps even more pivotal than countering nationalism. That being, utterly terrible working conditions, a near total lack of even the most basic workers' rights, a staggering level of economic inequality, and poor and marginalized people just generally being treated like vermin, and exposed to the most horrific forms of atrocity and injustice. So needless to say, unions were very popular with workers, as their only reliable means of trying to fight back against the despotic and dehumanizing employer class. One of the key features of the first Red Scare was a series of big strikes, like the failed Seattle General Strike, which was kind of the inciting incident of the first Red Scare itself. And just before we get to the other strikes, I'd like to mention the events of May Day 1919, specifically a large leftist protest march through Cleveland, Ohio, protesting the imprisonment of socialist, trade unionist, and founding member of the IWW, Eugene V. Debs. Think of him as basically the Ash from Evil Dead of the far left of a hundred years ago. Debs had been arrested two years earlier for encouraging workers to resist the draft. At his sentencing, he said the following badass quote, Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, as I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Anyway, a large protest march took place in Cleveland, and the leftists, who were just marching, not rioting, were confronted by a group of nationalists from an organization called Victory Alone that demanded the marchers lower their socialist flags. A unit of US Army soldiers then appeared, and also demanded the lowering of socialist flags. The marchers refused both the nationalists and the army. I guess they were thinking they had freedom of expression and assembly. The soldiers then attacked the protesters, as did the nationalists. The protesters fought back, and the situation turned into a massive fight, then became a riot. 
the army unit called for backup from the local police, who turned up and started laying into the leftists as well, by charging straight into the crowd while mounted on horseback, and swinging their clubs around indiscriminately. After this first situation had resolved, a second riot broke out after another army unit, or possibly the same unit, ordered a socialist to stop addressing an audience from a speaking platform. Gee, really not big on the whole freedom of expression thing, huh? Those mounted cops with clubs got back into the mix, and so did some old school tanks that had been bought cheap from the Germans by Cleveland police and by the army after World War I. And just a reminder, there were children among the leftists. It was supposed to be a peaceful vigil for Eugene Debs. Later on, a mob of soldiers, cops, and nationalists attacked the local headquarters of the Socialist Party and ransacked the whole building. And later still, there was a big bonfire of stolen socialist flags in public square. Go freedom, I guess? And immediately after the riots, the city passed a law banning socialist flags. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is that the media blamed the leftists for the violence, not the people that actually initiated it. Very fine people on both sides. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, or you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. I mean, did you see what they were waving? Go out in public with a flagpole dressed like that? They were asking for it. The narrative became that the leftists were stirring up trouble and provoking the nationalists, rather than that a group of people exercising their right to assemble and protest had been attacked in the streets and literally oppressed by the army, police, and nationalist thugs that were basically the Proud Boys of a century ago. And the highlight of this narrative pushed by the newspapers was when the Tribune said the following, Free speech has been carried to the point where it is an unrestrained menace. Now I can vaguely recall, somewhere in the distant past, that I was going to just quickly address the May Day riots before talking about the strikes during the first Red Scare. We should probably get on with that. In September 1919, there was a steel workers strike that shut down half the US steel industry, which led to the factory owners undertaking an anti-union propaganda campaign to discredit union leaders and misinform the public about the nature of the situation. They appealed to that great American pastime, nativism, with propaganda about the strike being masterminded by shadowy foreigners. It was an attack on the American way of life by the anti-freedom brigade shipped in from overseas. It was really hardline and blatant anti-union stuff is what I'm saying. And when I saw that bit in the Amazon video, it reminded me in that way of the propaganda campaign by the owners of the steel mills against the striking union workers. For Pete's sake, that was a long way to go to get to that thought. But the thing is, if I'd not talked about all that first and just said, wow, I haven't seen anti-union propaganda that blatant since the steel strike of 1919, many of you wouldn't have had the faintest idea what I was talking about. So that's my excuse. And by the way, the steel mill owners also brought in 30 to 40,000 black and Mexican American workers as scabs during the strike, and then put out propaganda appealing to the racism of the white striking workers. You know, look at these blacks working good honest white jobs. And then they put out disinformation about the strike having ended when it actually hadn't. So just a swell bunch of chaps. And their propaganda campaign totally worked. Public opinion turned against the unions big time. Oh, and at one point during the strike, the army took control of the city of Gary, Indiana, and declared martial law, and National Guardsmen that had been violently clashing with workers there had to leave the city when the army took over, and they vented their frustration about this by beating up some nearby striking workers down the harbor. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am so proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I'm proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world. I am proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I'm proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am damn proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I'm a proud American. 
America is the greatest country in the world, and I'm proud to be an American. America is the greatest country in the world, and I am proud to be an American. This right now is the greatest country on earth. What do you think the greatest country in the world is? America. Why? Because there's fun beaches and yeah. What other countries have you been to? Disneyland. There was also a big coal strike in which the coal bosses also did a propaganda campaign, this time alleging that Lenin and Trotsky had ordered the strike. Yes, yes, I'm sure they were keenly focused in the late 1910s on the working conditions of Pennsylvania coal mines. Totally plausible. So I think that about wraps up this rather lengthy tangent. Well, I certainly took the long way round to get to that rather needless comparison between the Amazon video and first Red Scare era anti-union propaganda. The Taft-Hartley Act, the spread of the international jury conspiracy theory, none of that even has anything to do with the point I was making. And it wasn't even that convincing a point. Honestly, as I started to get deep into that, I realized I had been subconsciously indulging my tendency to go on long tangents as a way to avoid having to face this ridiculous Amazon video. In this section, you will learn about the warning signs most commonly associated with early union organizing, as well as other warning signs that could indicate associate disengagement, vulnerability to organizing, or early organizing activity. Jesus Christ, Amazon. Vulnerable? Bit of mask up or you might catch organizing? Early warning signs that your workers might be, I don't know, evil vampires? While employees have the right to organize, we have a right and responsibility to share our position that a direct working relationship is better for the customer, the company, and the associate. To the river. Let's hope he got that whole bi-hourly thing sorted out, huh? In order to be able to do that effectively, it is critical that we recognize the early warning signs of potential organizing and escalate concerns promptly. If you see warning signs of potential organizing, notify your building HRM and GM site leader immediately. HRMs and GM site leaders should notify their assigned ER managers or ER principal immediately. Beware the insidious specter of organizing. Encourage your workers to sell out their colleagues for fun and profit. Except Amazon gets the profit, and the worker gets to be a fucking bootlicker. Now strap in folks, because this is where things get really cuckoo bananas. The most obvious signs would include use of words associated with unions or union-led movements like living wage or steward. Petitions or other concerted activity, such as an associate purporting to speak on behalf of his or her co-workers when raising concerns. There you have it, folks. If you hear anyone suggesting the concept of a living wage, then that person is a dangerous agitator, launching an attack on your American way of life. We are not anti-union. Living wage! Kill it with fire! Work two or three jobs and shut up and like it! The living wage. The idea that people should be able to make rent, pay bills, and eat food like every single day with just one full-time job without having to seek supplementary income from additional part-time jobs, doing gig economy stuff on the side. That kind of dangerous subversive idea has Amazon really worried, that they might have to view their workers as like human beings, as if they had some sort of, I don't know, obligation regarding their workers' quality of life? You know, them not being in near permanent misery, since they did all that work for you that you couldn't operate your vast business without? I love that the word contract is a warning sign. Yeah, you wouldn't want your workers to say, read and understand their contracts, seek to negotiate a change to their contract, or just understand, like, how contracts work, what the different types are, general discussion about contracts. These are very bad things done by bad people, obviously. And even the word representation is a warning sign, apparently. Wouldn't want workers to feel like their interests are being represented at their workplace. Can't have that. Gotta stamp that out. And I just want to revisit the last part of the awful thing that was said. Such as an associate purporting to speak on behalf of his or her co-workers when raising concerns. Now let's just replay that part about protected activity under the NLRB real quick. The easiest way to spot this type of protected activity is to look for anything that involves more than one person or is done on behalf of more than one person. I have an issue that impacts me is not generally protected activity. We have an issue that impacts us or, I have an issue, who else is with me, are telltale signs of potentially protected activity. So to recap, it only counts as protected activity when a worker is speaking on behalf of their co-workers, raising an issue that affects them as a group. And if they're just speaking for themselves, Amazon can legally just dismiss their concerns out of hand. But also, if a worker is speaking on behalf of their co-workers, that's a warning sign and Amazon doesn't like it. 
Well, gee whiz there, boy howdy. That sure sounds like Amazon doesn't like it when their workers engage in legally protected activity, and that Amazon only likes it when they can just dismiss them with a wave of their hand. Go back to work, robot. Stop trying to improve your working conditions and compensation. And you'd better hope that when a worker is representing other workers, that it isn't about a contract negotiation, because that's a triple warning sign with a combo bonus of 6,000 points. Union Graffiti. Union t-shirts, hats, jackets, or other clothing, union flyers, and union visitors in or near the parking lot. Some signs are less obvious than finding the actual union flyer, but they can still indicate associate disengagement, which is itself a warning sign for potential organizing. When I first watched this video, I'd assumed that associate disengagement was some Amazon doublespeak. Either that, or it was when a worker disengages their tongue from the boss's boot and stands up for themselves. And it is kind of true that the specific phrase, associate disengagement, is Amazon bullshit. But I was informed while working on this video that engagement is actually a well-known and established concept in human resources. It's a measurement of a group of workers, usually a large group's, level of satisfaction with the organization they work for. And the reason employers like to measure engagement is that high engagement means low turnover and high productivity, which in turn means more of that sweet, sweet money that they love so much. They aren't measuring it out of the kindness of their hearts. Engagement is affected by things like their specific workplace, their manager, the team they work in, the condition of the building they work in and its facilities, their pay rate, their benefits, the overall philosophy of the organization at large. It's affected by a lot of things. And while part of the end goal of measuring engagement is to come up with a specific percentage number to quantify the level of engagement, it also provides HR types with a whole host of information they can use to try and address low engagement. For example, the answers to questions on an engagement survey, which used to be a climate survey back in the day, before climate change made using that word in a non-literal way kinda obsolete. Anyway, the answers to questions on an engagement survey might reveal that a particular team within a remote part of the organization that has notably low engagement, that this team feels happy and satisfied with the team they're in, and their relationship with other remote teams is good too, but that their opinion of head office is very low. Perhaps they feel like head office's disconnection from them results in head office being out of touch with the actual realities of their team's situation, and that this has led to the wrong priorities being emphasized. A competent, non-ghoulish HR person might use this information to try and get head office to alter their approach to this team enough to solve the problem. One thing that I think it is interesting to note is that typically, corporate lingo avoids negative words, like how the term downsizing is avoided in favor of terms like restructuring and the newer right-sizing. And typically, engagement is not discussed in terms of engaged and disengaged. Instead, the phrasing is more like low engagement or very low engagement, rather than disengaged. That kind of goes against the norms of corpo speak. So now that I understand engagement better, it is curious to me that Amazon went with such a term. Also, their whole approach to and understanding of engagement is kind of warped and messed up. Let me explain what I mean. Sometimes, the presence of union activity might come up when looking at engagement. If a group of workers has very low engagement, they might decide to unionize, since the organization they work for itself has clearly failed to cater to their needs. But an employer that is more, uh, sane than Amazon would normally see this as a symptom of some other problem that is causing the low engagement in the first place, especially in a country like the United States where unionization is not exactly the norm. If a group of non-unionized workers is happy and engaged, they generally won't seek out union unionization unless their specific area of work has a union with a long traditional association with it, like teachers, nurses, and the film industry. So if a group of non-unionized workers outside of such fields suddenly reaches out to a union, most normal HR people would see that as an indication of some other problem that has caused those workers to become unsatisfied with their job, their workplace, or the organization they work for, or all three. And an employee relations manager might then get in touch with that union to find out from them what has caused the problem. So then, the union activity is a symptom of an engagement problem, and the union can be used to identify the problem and to solve it. That's the normal, non-batshit version of the situation. The Amazon version of the situation is to flip that completely on its head, view disengagement as the symptom, and the union activity as the problem. Can you see how their approach to this concept is super warped and messed up? Examples include associates who normally aren't connected to each other suddenly hanging out together. Associates who were close suddenly stop speaking to each other. Groups of associates scatter when approached by management. 
Oh shit, if your coworker sleeps with your wife, you better not stop hanging out with them, or some snitch will drop a dime on you to management. <laughs> I mean, what can I even say to this? This is some big brother shit right here. Are some workers hanging out together for the first time? Maybe they just realize they all like the show Ellis in Borderland and are sharing opinions about it. Or maybe they are organizing. And what about that little nugget about groups of workers scattering when approached by management? Is it just me or does that read like whatever suit wrote the script for this has been snubbed by groups of workers a couple too many times? Hey, Bob, they don't like you, okay? They think you're an authoritarian dork on a cringy power trip. Go home, Bob. Increased associate negativity, anger, or confrontation. Unusual complaints or change in passion or detail around complaints. Look, workers should be doormats, okay? Doormats don't get angry, they don't get passionate, and they don't complain. Those things would all interfere with our ability to step on them, wouldn't they? Unusual interest in policies, benefits, employee lists, or other company information. There's nothing unusual about workers wanting to know about benefits. Think about the implications of the attitude that Amazon wants their workers to have here. That job you have that you financially rely on to survive, would you like to know the specifics of that? No. Would you like to know some general information about the company that you work for? No. They want fundamentally incurious people. Don't ask questions. Don't get uppity. Know your place. Or any other associate behavior that is out of character. For example, an associate who normally leaves promptly begins hanging out in the break room for an hour after work each day. In order to recognize warning signs, it is critical that you know what an associate's normal behavior looks like. Often, it is the change in behavior that is the warning sign, more than the actual behavior itself. Thanks for the feedback yesterday. It was tough to hear, but at least I know what I need to work on to be a PA. This is a perfectly innocent comment. Labeling this as innocent in comparison to upcoming examples that Amazon doesn't like is so clearly implying that the bad ones are dangerous, guilty criminals. I got off work about an hour ago. This is a possible warning sign because the average associate would not wait so long after their shift without a reason. The reason could be that he is talking to his coworkers about a union. You would want to understand better why he is still in the break room so long after his shift ended. Or, you know, you could just stay out of your worker's fucking business and stop being a ghoul. This mindset is such authoritarian micromanaging garbage. I think this commenter put things well. I got off work about an hour ago. My car's in the shop, so I'm stuck waiting on my girlfriend to pick me up. He has provided a reasonable explanation for why he is at work so long after his shift, so this would not be considered a possible warning sign. Whereas if he'd been comparing payslips with his colleagues or hell just mentioned the words living wage, then this would be unreasonable. And speaking of... It's hard to make ends meet. I don't know. You guys don't pay a living wage. This is a possible warning sign because living wage is a concept unions push for. That every job should pay enough to support a family of four. Let's take a look at some sources here. Let's start as basic as possible. The dictionary. A wage that is high enough to maintain a normal standard of living. While I think this definition leaves some important stuff out, unsurprising given that this is fundamentally what dictionaries do with complex ideas, it certainly doesn't mention anything about a family, nor does it imply a group of people rather than the individual. This is the opening paragraph of the wiki article on the living wage, and it brings up the opposite, a subsistence wage as they call it. I prefer the term in-work poverty, as used in this paper by Eileen Brown, Annabelle Newman, and Sophia Blair. This wiki paragraph also mentions the term family wage, which seems like a better fit for what Amazon is actually describing. Look, I'm not suggesting that the ability to support a family is not part of what anyone ever means when they say living wage. For example, a worker with kids is going to be thinking about the ability to support those kids as part of what they mean when they say living wage. And here on the website for the organization Living Wage Aotearoa New Zealand, they refer to it as the hourly wage a worker needs to pay for the necessities of life and participate as an active citizen in the community. It reflects the basic expenses of workers and their families, such as food, transportation, housing, and childcare. So the family support aspect is baked right into their definition. 
But even there, there's nothing specific about the exact size of the family. No description of a living wage as being that which can support yourself and three other people. Because, as far as I can tell anyway, Amazon has simply pulled that out of its ass. If anyone can correct me on that assumption, please do in the comments. I actually read my comments. I'm that level of masochist. Now we move on to the next module in the video, which is about how managers should and should not talk to their workers about unions. And they use the acronym TIPS, as shown here, to refer to things banned under federal labor laws. It begins by talking about how the law says you're not allowed to threaten workers with negative repercussions for unionizing. For each of these, we'll look at some tips to avoid breaking any rules. While you might never think of making a threat, there will be times when you have to talk to associates about possible negatives of unionizing. For example, you would never threaten to close your building just because associates joined a union. US law is pretty bruh right here if my understanding is correct. Because while you supposedly cannot threaten to do a thing because of unionization, you absolutely can just do the thing. Which seems really weird to me, but whatever. But you might need to talk about how having a union could hurt innovation, which could hurt customer obsession, which could ultimately threaten the building's continued existence. So, managers, when you're threatening your workers with negative repercussions for unionizing, make sure you do it implicitly, not explicitly. On the DL, you get me? Super sly like. To avoid your comments being an unlawful threat, follow these rules. Avoid absolutes. Speak in possibilities instead. Take time to create proper context. For example, explain why having a union might make us less competitive before talking about what happens to businesses that aren't competitive. Never predict the future. We never know exactly what will happen in the future. Hold up. Explain why having a union might make us less competitive before talking about what happens to businesses that aren't competitive. Never predict the future. We may know what has happened in the past at our company or at other companies, but the future can never be fully predicted. To avoid interrogation, don't ask direct questions about union support or activity. Instead, ask questions we always ask to run our business, with or without organizing being involved, such as, what barriers do you have? What frustrates you? How are things going for you today? Is this a good day or a bad day? What's the latest word on the floor? When you're sniffing around for signs of union activity, don't be too blatant. Keep it vague or else a union might use that workers' rights crap against us. On the DL, remember. Don't ruin this for me. Lastly, use the power of silence. People tend to fill silence and talk more to avoid uncomfortable silence. If you're speaking about a topic, like a recent union meeting, using well-placed periods of silence may lead associates to volunteer additional detail. This is actually something they teach you in film school documentary courses, that when you're interviewing a subject and they stop talking, you don't immediately jump in to fill the silence, you let the silence linger as the subject may have more to add. Often the best parts of responses to interview questions are obtained this way. And to some degree this is just common courtesy, an attempt to not cut off someone whose speech patterns you probably aren't yet very familiar with. Maybe they're the kind of person who likes to take some quite long pauses in between thoughts. But past a certain point, it is also a bit manipulative in a way, because the person might not have been fully comfortable saying that part, and felt socially pushed to do so to some degree, just to fill the silence and to appease the interviewer, who was likely sitting there expectantly, hoping to get more. So yeah, I wasn't surprised to see a psychological tool with a manipulative element being advocated for here by Amazon, but I was a bit surprised that it was one that is specifically used in filmmaking. And this ain't on the common courtesy end of the spectrum, what Amazon is suggesting here. The point is clearly stated to be on the psychologically manipulative end of things, and very intentionally so. And remember, it's almost always better to listen than to speak. I shall be neither seen nor heard. Watch me. You can always tell a Milfred man.
This last line struck me as just creepy. Like it made me picture a sort of deranged corporate phony hanging around trying to use dude bro psychology hacks to trick their workers into poning themselves. To avoid spying, establish routine patterns of associate engagement. For example, make it a point to regularly talk to associates in the break room. This will help protect you from accusations that you were only in the break room to spy on pro-union associates. To avoid accusations of spying, just always be spying. Don't want your classmates to know you're a stoner? Just always be high. <laughs> I swear I saw a stoner movie or an episode of a TV show where that was a, literally a plotline. That's the logic level that this is operating at. I guess these managers think of themselves as like silky smooth operators mind-fucking the drones. But in reality, they're awkward dorks like Bob. Nothing against awkward dorks, I am one myself. Just don't be one of the Bob variety. Nobody likes Bob, not even the other Bobs. When you do overhear conversations, you do not have to leave or tune the conversation out as long as you are attending to your business and not eavesdropping. When you're eavesdropping on your workers, make sure you're doing it in cool guy secret stealth mode. Totally just going about my business, making this coffee for way too long. I'm like a corporate ninja, doing boot jitsu, Jedi mind tricking these fools, pretending to be super focused just looking into this cupboard, when the only thing in there is clearly just reams of blank paper and it's super obvious what I'm doing. Boot jitsu. <laughs> but to avoid even the appearance of surveillance, you can go a step further and join conversations appropriately. For example, you could say, I couldn't help hearing that you were discussing unions. I don't mean to butt in, but I'd love to share my opinion about unions with you. Sorry, I just cannot shake the image of a hypothetical manager in the Amazon anti-union training program being this corporate douchebag that thinks of themselves like a slick union-busting James Bond of capitalism. Perhaps not realizing that when movies do get made about this sort of stuff, people like them are on the villain side. These management characters that try to derail union organizing with a propaganda campaign are not the heroes in the movie Norma Ray. Norma Ray is the hero in the movie Norma Ray. In Salt of the Earth. The heroes are not the owners of the zinc company that is being systematically racist towards Mexican-American workers living in their company town. They are the Mexican-American workers. Grima Wormtongue is not the protagonist of Lord of the Rings. Those are three equally appropriate and applicable examples right there. You may be wondering if tips applies to unions. Generally, no, tips does not apply. Unions cannot make threats, but there is no rule against unions interrogating or spying. As we all know, the US system really favors the unions. The deck is well and truly stacked against the corporations. And water is dry and the sky is green. As for promises, the union can say just about anything it wants. Propaganda? Really? This video trying to call something else propaganda. This video. Really? The living wage boogeyman video from the company that reacts to their employees discussing contracts like it's the worker uprising sequence from Malcolm in the Middle. Fergus, the hamsters have left the wheel. This is not a drill. The hamsters have left the wheel. The law says companies can't make promises because they control wages and benefits. They could make their promises come true. Oh, for Pete's sake, it's not because a corporation has the power to fulfill promises. It's because powerful corporations have a long and very well-documented history of just absolutely lying their asses off whenever and to whomever it suits them. I mean, seriously, just because corporations control wages doesn't mean that they can just fulfill whatever promise they might happen to make to a worker. Think about the logic there. Corporations control wages, so they have the power to fulfill a promise about, say, 
an increase in wages, but not just to fulfill any promise they should make. It's just such a terrible, lazy argument Amazon is making here. Greedy business ghouls have been taken to court thousands of times for false advertising, intentionally lying to customers, outright disinformation, fraudulent behavior on a mass scale, and there's lots of regulations that have been implemented because of this. I don't even know why I'm bothering to argue this. It is self-evident that greedy corporate executives have said and will say just about anything to achieve whatever self-serving shit they're trying to do. I don't think I really need to convince anyone that businesses have been known to lie a bunch. That's why laws get passed about corporations lying during negotiations, both with other businesses and with their workers, and a promise that you never intended to keep is a lie. That's what that is. But unions' promises are considered to be propaganda empty campaign talk, precisely because the union can't make its promises come true. What a load of tosh, just completely ahistorical claptrap. Oh yes, Amazon, as we all know, when the union swore to never stop the fight for the 40-hour week until it was won, they failed miserably. And that's why the standard work week is 10 hours a day, Monday through Saturday. And before that, the 10-hour day movement itself, well, they failed, of course, hence why the standard working day is 12 to 14 hours. Wait. Do you really think that, say, someone here in New Zealand, a government worker, would remain a dues-paying member of the public sector workers' union, the PSA, if they didn't routinely fulfill promises? If they didn't have a long-established track record of achieving gains for their members? If they just went around making promises every year and just never fulfilled them? Unlike having a job, which is necessary for most people to live, being in a union isn't necessary, in most places, though there are exceptions where mandatory union membership rules still exist. They got scrapped here in New Zealand a long time ago though, so a hypothetical government worker doesn't have to join the PSA, it's a choice. Workers make such a choice because unions make good on their word as much as they can. They are a worthwhile type of organization to opt to be part of. Their word carries weight with their members, unlike big business, whose word is notoriously worth so little that one of the very first things a government does upon the introduction of capitalism into that society is pass laws forcing corporations to stay true to the terms of business contracts. This is such a necessity that it has become one of the defining features of what a capitalism is. You should feel very comfortable speaking to associates about unions, knowing that almost anything you say is lawful. Remember, as long as what you're saying doesn't violate tips, it's okay. But to help you understand what you should say and to help you stay closely aligned with our philosophy, we use the acronym FOUR, Facts, Opinions, Rules, and Experiences. You can share facts about unions with employees. Typically, we share facts about how unions work and how unions would or would not impact associates as opposed to talking about union corruption or other similar anti-union horror stories. So, when you're cherry-picking examples that make unions look as bad as possible, you gotta be careful not to get too blatant about that. Remember our policy about the down low. One thing we will always do, however, is correct any misinformation put out by unions, even if that means we are wrongly perceived as anti-union. Allow me to translate this part. We will push back super hard against anything and everything negative that a union says about us, whether what we are saying is true or not, whether what they are saying is true or not. We will make anti-union training videos to help our managers manipulate their workforce. We will fight tooth and nail to the bitter end, beyond all logic and reason, against any attempt whatsoever by any union to in any way help our workers, or God forbid actually to unionize them. We will send out angry tweets to politicians who support any unionization efforts. More on that soon. Opinions can be mild, like, I'd rather work with associates directly, or strong. The unions are lying, cheating rats. The law protects both. Opinions can be expressed mildly or strongly in terms of tone and frequency. Amazon prefers a mild opinion expressed strongly. Managers, don't say the quiet part out loud. Gotta be careful about that. Someone might record you doing so and leak it to the media. That's why we want you to be all sneaky-like. Not because it's necessarily illegal or anything. Remember, the state is on our side. It's because that pesky free press might get wind of it and kick up a stink. Off the record, on the QT, and very hush, hush. Remember, we're mind-fucking these drones, right? Get your doublespeak game up. Work that gibberish.
And besides, it's one thing to just say something and then the other person decides whether they agree or not. We're not into that. What we want to do is trick the other person into believing what we want without ever having the decency to just be straight up about it. We frequently and proudly remind associates of the values of a direct working relationship, but we avoid anti-union rhetoric. If the workers can tell it's openly anti-union, then the media can too. But if we say, direct working relationship, then we can slip our shit in under the radar. Use words that seem harmless and inoffensive. Frame your anti-union ideas in a saleable way. So, instead of talking about... Unions are worse than Dracula. Talk about... Direct working relationship. You have the right to enforce work rules. Just don't suddenly start enforcing if you haven't done so before. You can and should set up a draconian, autocratic working environment, but you gotta do so from the get-go. See, if a worker comes into a miserable, oppressive workplace, that's not a news story, it's just a shitty development in their life. But if a workplace that wasn't that horrible suddenly becomes like Amazon-level horrible, like top-tier shit, then that is a potential news story. We can't have that. So be sure to crack the whip like an absolute bastard right from the start. That's the Amazon way. You can also explain labor law rules, like bargaining is a give-and-take process, there are no guarantees. Associates may have misconceptions about how unions or the union election process would work. Just as Amazon.com wants to be the one-stop source for customers regardless of what they are seeking, we want to be the one-stop source for information. And the video cuts out there, so we can't know how that sentence was going to finish. But I'm going to assume it was one-stop shop for all quote-unquote information about unions that our workers are exposed to. Except, you know, translated into Amazon dialect corpo speak. They definitely do want their workers' views about labor and unions to be led by them, rather than them being exposed to information from, say, a union. Or, like, a book. That'd be a disaster too, workers reading about the labor movement, getting all that information that hasn't been through our Amazon approved filtration process, or even just an Amazon manager who hasn't been through the thing that they don't call an anti-union training program, but is definitely an anti-union training program. I thought I'd cap off this video by mentioning something that came to my attention while writing the script. So it turns out that Jeff Bezos had a whine to his PR team that they weren't being hardline anti-union enough for him. That they weren't pushing back against Amazon's perceived enemies like a teenage edgelord furiously typing between sips of Mountain Dew Code Red. So at the sound of their master's voice and at his behest, they started to get really salty and pathetic on Twitter, going after politicians that tweeted criticisms of Amazon in a manner reminiscent of a recently divorced dad drunkenly tweeting about how society favors women over men because his kids don't want to see him anymore. Anyway, after this sudden sharp change in tone from generic professional PR company to Sargon of Akkad meets Bob from Office Space, a technical engineer filed a suspicious activity report thinking the account had been hacked. And Amazon unsurprisingly tried to bury the report. Facts, right? Huh, look at that. The employees that contacted the media about this incident did so under anonymity. I wonder why they were so worried about professional reprisal. Let's put a pin in that. So, let's take a look at a couple of these tweets, huh? The first example is in response to Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin, who, by the way, continues to go after Amazon. Here's his most recent tweet at the time of me writing this sentence. Anyway, here's the relevant tweet. He mentions the infamous story about Amazon delivery drivers having to pee in bottles because of their micromanaging slave-driving bosses. And he mentions Amazon's union-busting activities. In response, drunk Amazon PR dad said this. As this Vice article points out, the drivers peeing in bottles thing is very well documented. It's a major talking point among Amazon delivery drivers. Just check the Amazon delivery driver subreddit where they talk about it a bunch. Regardless of how obviously true it is though, they deny it anyway because the real point here is that any Amazon employee who contacts the media is by definition dirty, stinking, lying scum, regardless of what obviously legitimate evidence they bring with them. Oh. And regarding the nobody would work for us thing, I love this capitalist fantasy world where every worker can just pick who to work for and who not to with complete freedom of choice. Like if there's no available jobs in their field and their area except with Amazon, well they'll just starve on principle. 
Sorry kids, I gotta take a stand. So you're just gonna have to take a few months off from eating, okay? People who talk like this come off as so out of touch to me. In the real world, most workers put out applications to every company in their area operating in the relevant field of work in order to maximize their chances of finding a job. Their personal feelings towards the ethics of each company takes a back seat to being able to pay rent and bills. That's how it really is. This wonderland of absolute worker choice sounds nice though. Maybe we should create that. Out of the ashes of the status quo or something? And then Amazon speaks for literally all their employees, just cramming words into their mouths like I cram bento into mine. And if anyone is wondering what the two of two here is, it's just a basic diversionary tactic, not convincingly executed. And the other example here is responding to Elizabeth Warren, whose criticisms are more mild than Pocan's, but who is more famous a politician, so she gets three tweets. And this time, let's just stick to the first one. At some point, indulging drunk PR dad just turns into enabling. Warren's tweet is about Amazon and taxes. In reply, the PR account said this. The first half of this tweet is so full of shit on so many levels. I mean, I guess on the face of it, maybe them pointing out that she's the one in government, not them, might seem reasonable. Except that she didn't say it was down to Amazon to create legislation, so them pointing out that it isn't really doesn't land. And the idea that Amazon just follows them is transparently bullshit. All we do with the law is follow it. We don't spend large amounts of money lobbying the government to pass the kinds of laws we like. We don't give money to political campaigns to get powerful politicians on our side. You make the laws, we follow them. Simple as that. And this next sentence is a pearl too. If you, individual politician Elizabeth Warren, don't like the current laws, just change them. You created them after all, you single member of Congress. Warren obviously isn't in sole control of legislation. And I imagine every senator and member of the House has a bunch of laws they'd like to change in some way or another, but might not actually be able to. It's like a child's view of how politics works, this drivel that Amazon is spouting here. And of course, the other thing is, changing the law is exactly what Warren says she is trying to do in the tweet they are replying to. Like, it seems pretty self-evidently clear that she doesn't need you to point out to her that she could pass a law. And if the point of their tweet was to be all like, go ahead, change the law, we're cool with that, then why the snarky and hostile tone? Hell, why even reply at all? And as for that last sentence of Amazon's tweet, I'll just leave these here. Hey there, this is me near the end of the long process of making this video. While working on it, I put my back out at one point and my work slowed to a crawl. Then while my back was messed up, I got strep throat and my work stopped entirely for more than two weeks. Honestly, this thing has been a nightmare, but it's finally almost done and I'll be able to move on with my life. Before wrapping this up though, I thought I'd quickly take advantage of the fact that it has been a month and a half since I actually wrote the script for this video by adding some follow-up information since there have been developments in some of the stuff I mentioned. Most importantly, the union vote in Bessemer, Alabama failed, and thus those workers remain non-unionized. Which sucks, but is sadly not surprising. Union culture in the modern United States is currently weak, of course, though it is growing. The other thing I found interesting was this. Amazon issued an apology to Mark Pocan and admitted that DSP drivers do pee in bottles. I wonder if they also stated that the earth is not flat for good measure. Okay, last thing before I go. I just wanted to hugely thank Whole Worker for leaking the Amazon anti-union video and hosting it on their channel. Whole Worker is a union of workers at Whole Foods. They do great work, and as well as stating my sincere gratitude for making this video possible and making people aware of Amazon's internal propaganda, I also wanted to strongly express solidarity with Whole Worker. Keep fighting the good fight. Okay, that's all from me for now. Farewell, comrades and potential comrades, and I shall see you next time. You know, hopefully.